Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay, I'm just going to wait for a couple of minutes until everyone has joined. And will you record the webinar? Yes. Yep, Great. we already started recording. Hi, Samir. Excellent. Hello. Okay, let's start. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, How Global Events Affect Your Country for the Middle East and Africa. Uh, the webinar is a collaboration between Emerald Publishing and Oxford Analytica, uh, the collaboration behind our products expert briefings. And I just want to start with uh, a quick um, uh, explanation of uh, the application of the GoTo webinar. You'll find on your top right the control panel uh, uh, where you can find the chat, you can pop in uh, the questions whenever we go throughout the webinar. Uh, and then we will go through the questions towards the end. Uh, my name is uh, Nadine Salah. I'm the Regional Marketing Manager for the Middle East, North Africa, Pakistan and Turkey. Uh, and we, we have today with us our panelists, which I would like to introduce now, uh, Gabby Hart, who is the Cases and Expert Briefings Product Manager at Emerald Publishing. We have Nick Redman, Editor-in-Chief and Director of Analysts at Oxford Analytica. And we have uh, a very unique uh, selection of analysts. Uh, this time, we managed to, with the help of uh, Nick and Gabby, we managed to have four of the global analysts with us in today's webinar. Uh, we have Dr. Warwick Knowles. Uh, I'll go through the, um, through the brief bio about every uh, analyst. Dr. Warwick Knowles is the analyst for Middle East. He has a PhD from the University of Durham. His thesis was on the political economy of Jordan, and he previously worked as a country risk analyst and taught, and taught Middle East politics and economics in both Durham and Newcastle universities. Welcome, Dr. Darwick, uh, Dr. Warwick. Thank you. Uh, and we have Catalina, Katerina Piazzi. He is the analyst for North Africa. She's an MA holder from the Department of War Studies, King's College London, and she has a BA from Boston University. Welcome, Katerina. And we have, uh, hold on, I can't see the screen. We have Dr. Nathaniel for Western, the analyst for Western and Southern Africa. He holds a PhD in international history and politics, MA in international studies from the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies. Uh, Geneva and BA in political science and French literature from the University of Rochester. Welcome, Dr. Nathaniel. Uh, Dr. Matt from East Africa, the analyst for East Africa. He holds a PhD in politics, University of Edinburgh, and a master's degree in international relations, University of Edinburgh as well, and the University of Sydney, and a bachelor's of law at University of Newcastle upon time. He is an ex-United Nations, uh, used to work in the Department of Peacekeeping Operations, and he's the exec was the executive office of the Secretary General, and his work for the United Nations has encompassed both field missions in Africa as well as posting at the UN headquarters. Welcome, Dr. Matt. I'd like to thank you all for participating in our uh, webinar, and I'll, uh, I'll uh, now leave the floor to Gabby to give you a brief intro about expert briefings and about Oxford Analytica. For their collaboration. Brilliant, thank you very much Nadine um, and thank you very much um, for everyone from Oxford Analytica for your, for your time today um, and for everyone attending this session. Um, so as Nadine mentioned my name is Gabby Hart, I'm the case studies and expert briefings product manager um, at Emerald Publishing. Uh, so to give a little bit of a background um, to expert briefings, since 2020, we've worked with Oxford Analytica to bring the daily brief to academic audiences for teaching and research purposes. Oxford Analytica are an independent geopolitical analysis and advisory firm who create the content and we bring these to the academic audiences. The briefings uh, are created by over 1,500 academics, former policymakers, regulators and industry leaders. Um, 
who create the content from a mass of complicated, um, often confusing information into relatively short, succinct and plain spoken English for easy understanding. Um, so to give a little bit of context in terms of the kind of content that we publish, um, there are three types of briefing. There is the executive summary, which is very short and can be read in a few minutes and gives a succinct account of a situation. The expert briefings are more in-depth, two-page uh, articles that look in more detail about the what, why and what next of a certain geopolitical event. And then finally, we have the graphic analysis, which present a range of data in a visual form. Um, and Oxford Analytica create 16, um, or on average, 16 briefings per day um, that Emerald Publishing then publish. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how to um, how this content can be used in teaching and research, um, but I kind of want to hand over to the analysts as quickly as possible. So I'm going to talk very quickly um, about this, but please do see um, on the screen, uh, sorry, just on that first slide, my email address is there. So please do reach out to me if you are interested um, in getting access to the expert briefings content. Um, and then I will also put that link there in the chat. Um, this is to sign up for our monthly pick email. Um, which contains um, a few samples um, of free expert briefings content each month and a bit more information about how these can be used in teaching and research. Uh, sorry, so but, yeah, on to that next slide now. Thank you, Nadine. Um, so just a very quick kind of cover of uh, how expert briefings can be used in teaching and also in research. Um, so these can be used to keep teaching relevant. So the real world up-to-date briefings can be used by themselves or alongside case studies to ensure that teaching is relevant and engaging for students. So for example, if you use potentially an older case study and want to update that with more up-to-date information, we find that pairing cases with these expert briefings is a really brilliant way of doing that. Um, the executive summaries I mentioned are particularly short and we know that these are used by faculty as in-class reading to introduce students to new topics and new subject areas that students can kind of take two or three minutes within class to read those, um, whereas the longer briefings are used, to, can be used as assignments to delve into more um, in-depth themes for students. Uh, to inspire tomorrow's decision makers, um, so expert briefings give your students the same access um, to the same analysis used by governments and global business leaders around the world and allows the students to see unbiased and accurate information about global events to inform their uh, research decisions. The global and interdisciplinary coverage of the content um, means that expert briefings cover topics and countries that are often neglected by mainstream media, which allow students to see different sides of complex situations that are otherwise presented in newspapers, for example. Um, they can also be used across your institution, so in a number of different departments and on a number of different courses. And also the global coverage means that, again, pairing these with case studies and maybe international cases or cases outside of your region, you can supplement that case content with the expert briefings content that is local to your region. Um, and then finally, expert briefings can also be used to develop your students' core skills. Um, so we know that uh, this content is used by some faculty um, to uh, get students to kind of come up with their own um, briefings or their own graphic analysis, um, help students to present their own information and also to include uh, the content in their research and also faculty's own um, research as well. Uh, as I said, that was a very kind of quick uh, whistle stop tour there on kind of how these can be used. Please do um, reach out on my email address um, or sign up for that monthly pick and I will pop both of those in the chat if there are any kind of further questions on that. And I will pass back to Nadine. Thank you, Gabby. And now we're going to start with our webinar. So we're going to start with Nick Redman, who is the Editor-in-Chief and Director of Analysis at Oxford Analytica. Nick will be giving us a, pre a brief introduction about macroeconomics, and then we will head to the presentations for uh, each analyst uh, for each region. Dr. Nick, I'd like to give the mic to you. Uh, Nadine, thank you very much. 
Um, let me start with a few comments to provide some global context for this session. Um, as we know, food and energy prices right now are very high, but it's important to note, I think, that they were high well ahead of uh, the start of the conflict in Ukraine. And this was a consequence of post-pandemic recovery, so demand increasing in the face of supply chain troubles. The UN Food Price Index uh, started 2021 in January that year at around 110, but it ended the year close to 140. The UN Cereals Price Index stood at 125 in January 2021, but it closed the year around about 150, and it spiked to 170 in April in the wake of Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the closure of those ports in the Black Sea. Today it is around the 145 level, but to give context, from 2016 to 2020, this index was ranging between 90 and 100. So prices we see today are very high, but they were high even before the war started. Now, the picture is similar uh, with oil. The Brent price per barrel was $55 at the start of 2021. It ended the year around $80 a barrel. And as we know, it went well above 120, 130 in the wake of the invasion. Today, it runs in the 80, 90 dollar range. And again, based on the previous few years, this is an elevated price and gas prices also are high. Food and energy prices, when they rise, have an outsized political and economic effect. Energy prices ultimately affect the price of a huge range of goods that are manufactured and or transported. Food prices, of course, are one of the most uh, likely things to cause political turbulence. Put them together and the world is facing the most sustained bout of inflation it has seen in decades. Now, the macroeconomic context for the coming year is not particularly favorable. 2023 should be the year that some of these pandemic related disruptions to supply in the global economy ease back. But even if they do so, we will not be returning to 2019. It will be a very different macroeconomic context, and it's one that will have profound political and geopolitical impacts. Mainly, this is because of a change in monetary policy in major economies, which will affect almost every part of the world. In the space of about four months this year, starting in March, the US Federal Reserve hiked its policy rate by 300 basis points. As we know, the dollar has surged against every other currency and other central banks have been obliged either to raise their rates or bring forward their plans to do so, to avoid an outflow of capital and to support their currencies at a time when currency weakness increases inflationary pressure even more because so many commodities are priced in dollars. And so if your currency is weakening against the dollar, those prices go up. This great tightening is bringing to an end years of very cheap borrowing for governments and for companies in emerging and developed markets alike. We are exiting from an era of unprecedentedly cheap and plentiful credit, which was assisted by quantitative easing, and developed country banks, central banks, anaesthetizing their financial markets. Never before has so much credit been generated, while the cost of borrowing has remained at a record low. So we are at the start now of a great unwinding in financial markets that will leave governments less able to finance their deficits. The greatest strain will fall on those with the greatest short-term liabilities. It's not the debt ratio that bankrupts governments, although this is a widely quoted measure, it's the repayment schedule over the next year or two that can do so. The great unwinding is also going to leave consumers less able to service their debt. Discretionary spending, things beyond food and fuel, will take a hit. And it threatens right across the world to put zombie companies, those that are able to service their debts, but not pay off their debts or invest in new production, it can force those into liquidation. These effects will range right across the world. Developed markets will suffer, but emerging ones will likely suffer more as borrowing spreads increase. We've been here, of course, before. It's not the first financial crisis that we're facing down. But this one could be different because today a lot of the debt is corporate rather than sovereign. The international financial architecture is not designed for this. There is no IMF, there is no Paris club, there is no London club for distressed corporate borrowers. That could make resolution of debts more difficult when uh, borrowers go into default, unless governments step in, and many are likely to end up in the courts. So this therefore is the rather depressing uh, context in which regional and national dynamics will play out. The economic turbulence is going to have considerable social and political effects right around the world. I turn now to my colleagues to give you a more considered view on particular countries and regions. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Nick, for this insightful uh, brief. And uh, Dr. Warwick, if you would please uh, tell us your um, analysis on the Middle East. Well, I will do. Thanks, Nadine. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Today I'm going to focus on four topics in relation to the Middle East. The first three topics are connected to the Ukrainian war. We're going to look at geopolitical, the macroeconomic impact, thirdly, food security issues. Then I'll turn briefly to climate change. So first, the geopolitical impacts of the Ukrainian war have and will differ across the region, with winners, losers, and those that are conflicted by the issue. Turkey's President Erdogan has boosted his international reputation through his involvement in securing the UN brokered deal, allowing exports of Ukrainian wheat. This will help shore up his support for, his, for him and his party's faltering electoral chances in the June 2023 presidential and parliamentary elections. However, economic concerns around high inflation and a weak currency are hampering his re-election efforts. The big political, geopolitical loser in the region is obviously Iran, which has strengthened its ties with Russia, but to the detriment of its international standing. An alliance of the sanctioned, if you will. Tehran has belatedly acknowledged that it did sell drones to Moscow, but claims that this was before the invasion. Closer ties with Moscow, along with the government's inability to deal with the Masa Amini protests, has meant that the nuclear deal negotiations with the EU and indirectly with the US have fallen into abeyance. The deal is unlikely to be resurrected in the first half of 2023, at least, uh, unless there is significant change in the approach of the Iranian government towards the protests, Russia and the talks themselves. The countries that the war has created geopolitical uncertainties for include the Gulf states, particularly Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, along with Israel. These countries have continued to attempt to try to balance ties with Russia and the United States. The Gulf states and Russia, through OPEC Plus, have attempted to maintain the oil price at around $100 per barrel, much to the disgust of Washington. The US wants the Gulf states to act as a regional barrier towards Iranian adventurism. However, Riyadh and Abu Dhabi are unlikely to break ties with Moscow or Iran during 2023. In the case of Israel, the then Prime Minister Naftali Bennett attempted to negotiate between Russia and Ukraine in the early days of the war, but was quickly sidelined by other actors. Since then, Israel has followed a path of limited support for Kyiv but without alienating Moscow. The election of Netanyahu is unlikely to change Israel's policy direction towards the war. Netanyahu himself used posters of himself and the Russian president Vladimir Putin during his electoral campaign in 2019. Turning now to the macroeconomic impacts of the war, as Nix said, these have pushed the global economy towards recession, raised global interest rates and inflation, and resulted in falling exchange rates for emerging economy currencies against the US dollar. Supply side shocks have impacted on terms of trade and the current accounts. As with the geopolitical issue, the macroeconomic, macroeconomic impacts have resulted in winners and losers across the Middle East. The oil exporting countries of the Gulf are the obvious winners, having benefited from higher hydrocarbon prices. These revenues have improved their current account and fiscal account positions. Oman, for example, has turned double digit deficits on both the current account and fiscal account into surpluses. This has enabled it to start paying down its indebtedness. 
for other countries like Saudi Arabia, it's enabled investment levels to be boosted, to move those, themselves away from their dependence on hydrocarbon revenues. These trends will continue in 2023, but will slow beyond that as hydrocarbon prices ease. In contrast, the oil importing countries in the region have been hard hit by the oil price rise and those of other commodities. The terms of trade have swung sharply against Jordan, Israel, Lebanon, Syria and Turkey, worsening their current and fiscal account balances. This is adding to the public debt burden at a, tub, at a time when interest rates are climbing. Higher debt servicing will reduce the capacity for governments to increase their spending to offset the impact of a global slowdown. Lebanon is already an economic meltdown, but Jordan, with its climbing indebtedness and peg currency, could face problems over the next 24 months. It may have to ask for yet another debt restructuring package and implement a devaluation of its currency. However, a man will be able to call on international support from the likes of the IMF and the Gulf states because of its perceived geopolitical role as an arena of stability in an, in an inherently unstable area. The glimmer of hope for these countries is the easing of commodity prices over the next 12 to 24 months. The third regional impact of the Ukrainian war is food security, which was already a growing problem before Russia's invasion. The region, like other food importing areas, has been hit by curtailed access to wheat and higher costs of food imports. Domestic agricultural sectors are suffering from higher fertilizer costs amid already challenging climatic conditions across much of the region. To give you an idea of the challenges, in 2020, that's before COVID-19 struck, in the Palestinian territories, over 25% of people were food insecure. Over 37% of the population in Yemen and Iraq were malnourished. The position was forecast to worsen in these countries, Lebanon and Syria. Lebanon was the most exposed of the economies to the Ukrainian war, with more than 95% of its wheat sourced from Russia and Ukraine. High dependency levels were also evident in Oman, the United Arab Emirates, and Yemen. When the economic impacts are combined with the food security issues, the chance for social unrest increased significantly. The already horrendous humanitarian situation is likely to worsen in Yemen and northern Syria at a time when the international community's focus is on the humanitarian impact of the war in Ukraine. In Yemen, for example, militias are able to attract fighters by providing a regular wage. Lebanon, Jordan and Iraq will face social unrest related to food issues. Turning now to my final topic, that of climate change. Ironically, the high oil prices caused by the war have spurred the oil-rich states to start to seriously look at a post-carbon world. The initial impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, when oil prices famously went negative for a very short spell, highlighted the oil-rich states' vulnerability to these revenues, not just in terms of prices, but also export volumes. The inflow of hydrocarbon money as oil and gas prices have rebounded have boosted the ability of the oil rich states to invest huge sums into green energy. Saudi Arabia and the UAE are pushing blue hydrogen, that is renewable based hydrogen, while Qatar is focused on green hydrogen production through the use of natural gas. The use of solar power is also expanding rapidly in the region. We can expect a lot of high profile promises from the oil rich states in relation to decarbonisation over the next 12 to 24 months, as they vie with each other for which country is the most committed. Saudi Arabia, for example, 
has launched the Middle East Green Initiative, which has been heavily promoted during COP27. Qatar has set the most challenging targets, but will rely on gas rather than renewable. Thank you very much for your time, and I look forward to your questions in due course. Thank you, Dr. Warwick. Uh, I would like to stress on the fact that for the attendees, if you would like to have any questions for any of our analysts today, please uh, put them in the chat and we will go through the questions towards the end. And now I'll give the floor to Katerina, our analyst for North Africa. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> well, as Mick mentioned, economics are the primary concern about uh, among the North African countries as well for next year, and they're quite affected by many of the trends that um, Warwick has just mentioned. I will um, do a more country by country briefing, and I will start with Egypt and and with Morocco, as there's only five countries uh, included. So starting with Egypt, Egypt's economy has uh become very precarious it has resorted to support from the imf for the third time in six years um and that's this year again uh the government is banking on its gulf arab allies and on global bond investors to supplement the relatively small three billion dollar imf loan with additional investment the actual inflows from these sources may disappoint, however. This is partly because of the poor state of the global economy, but also because of skepticism about Cairo's com commitment to structural reform, and in particular through reining in the role of the military in the economy. There is a risk that the Egyptian pound will continue to depreciate following its 35% fall against the dollar this year. This will keep inflation high, right? the average is about 13% in 2022 and this in turn will ensure that interest rates stay elevated the pressure on the balance of payments will be eased to some extent by increased gulf invest investment but this tends to involve acquisitions of stakes in existing companies rather than supporting new projects uh, against this difficult economic backdrop uh, president sisi will be gearing up for re-election in 2024 uh, there's little chance that any credible challengers will emerge to contest the election, given the tight control uh, that Sisi's regime has imposed on the formal political space. However, sporadic economic protests are likely next year and threats to Sisi's position from within the military establishment and the intelligence services cannot be discounted. Moving to its neighbour now, Libya has become divided again along familiar east-west lines. This is likely to get worse next year as the political scene becomes further fragmented. Earlier this month, we've heard from Eastern Strongman Khalifa Haftar threatening to wage another war to, I quote, liberate the country, uh, which suggests that divisions between him and Tripoli are hardening again. Um, nonetheless, it does not look like he has the external support to threaten the capital itself militarily, but he can still use um, oil blockades, oil blockades to um, put pressure on the government. Uh, the Prime Minister uh, in Tripoli, Abdul Hamid Dabeba, is in a precarious position, primarily because he has relied a lot on Turkish support. And this has led him to now patronize armed groups of his own, and that's causing friction with Turkey's supported forces. The volatility we've seen in Tripoli is matched across Libya as challenges grow to Haftar and his son's harsh rule in the east and the south. A spark could easily come from popular unrest, and the economy has been deteriorating, and ordinary Libyans have been struggling with severe inflation, lack of employment, lack of public services, a lot of it is due to corruption, so we're likely to see more and more dissatisfaction with the political class, which insists on staying where it is. The speakers of the two rival parliaments have been dominating talks around new elections. This means that any international unity we might have seen this year around a push for new elections is likely to splinter more than 
and a new process um, uh, being imposed. Moving on to Tunisia, which is also on a rather difficult spot, uh, and its own prospects are again um, tied to its economy. The government will need to ensure public sector salary payments and um, adequate imports of essential goods in order to stabilize again and see a period of consolidation under President Kai Sayed. Um, if he fails to do that, then Tunisia could experience a pretty acute economic crisis. The president's popularity is shrinking, but by next year, he will likely have succeeded in recreating Tunisia's political system. Uh, parliamentary elections are scheduled for December 17th, and these will probably leave his political opposition significantly weaker. He will then have to, well, he will then have the difficult task of governing a very divided and economically crippled country. And he has not shown great, great promise to this um, effect so far. So next year is likely to be uh, more ineffectual policy making and a very volatile atmosphere um, in Tunisia. And that's, we've already seen that that's resulting in an increase in people leaving from Tunisia. Uh, there's been a, a rise in, in um, Tunisian migrants arriving in European shores. Again, ultimately, it will all depend on Tunisia's economy. Um, an, an IMF loan is due um, of about $2 billion, uh, which will slow down the current freefall, but the sum itself is relatively insignificant to Tunisia's budget, and the hope is that it will trigger further support mechanisms. Uh, again, like in Egypt, Tunisia is going to look to Gulf Arab states for help, though that help will also probably come at the cost of key state assets, as we're seeing in Egypt. Algeria has provided, has seen a financial windfall from the Ukraine war, uh, primarily because of the high energy prices. This will not necessarily translate into sustainable improvements in the performance of the economy, because the private sector has still not recovered from the turbulence that followed, that followed the, the fall of President Abdelaziz Bouteflika back in 2019. That said, higher oil and natural gas prices have allowed Algeria to build up its foreign exchange reserves back up to about $60 billion. The government has also replenished its reserve fund, which uh, was down to zero in 2017. Uh, the, the government envisages a 19% increase in total spending next year, again, in its draft budget. Um, this will go towards raising state sector salaries protection as protection against rising inflation. Um, in the budget, there's also a 120% increase in military spending, so around $23 billion. And much of this will go towards payments for Russian arms supplies. Uh, next year, well, the budget revenue is based on an oil assumption of about $60 per barrel. And as Nick said, uh, I think it was an OPEC or uh, Gulf states really aim for about $100 per barrel next year. So Algeria will continue to see um, uh, an, an inflow of, of uh, funds for its natural gas exports. Lastly, Morocco has really struggled this year. Um, this, the, the, the economy is likely to improve um, in 2023. Uh, the uh, tourism is likely to recover. Agriculture is also likely to improve because it contracted sharply this year because of a really long drought. Uh, overall, the economy is likely to grow again about 3% um, in real times, uh, which was uh, it was down to 1% this year. Um, the government is likely to, re to seek financial support from the IMF, um, but plans uh, for a, a sovereign bond issue in 2022 were dropped because of the market turbulence. Um, the IMF has expressed support for the government social protection scheme, 
which was rolled out last year and but but it did advise the central bank to tighten monetary policy further overall morocco is in a difficult position and um the the prime minister has been trying to deal with it but it's possible that we will see more public protests there as well and i will stop then hand over to africa thank you katharina um i'm actually from egypt and uh i can relate to many of uh, to many of the points that you've mentioned when it comes to the economy in egypt so it's been a very tough year and i think on many of the countries as well in the region and uh yeah let's hope um, let's hope it gets better somehow for the next years it would be interesting as well to see uh for our attendees today uh, joining us where they come from and if you can relate to what you're hearing so far how is the situation in your uh, for the economical situation in your countries that would be interesting so again let us know where everyone is joining us throughout the chat and we're now going to head to Dr. Nathaniel Powell for Western and Southern Africa. Dr. Nathaniel, I'm handing over to you. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I'd just like to note that I'm sick, so if I collapse in a fit of coughing, uh, just bear with me, I'll recover and I'll be able to continue. Um, hopefully, I won't be too embarrassed. Um, no, sorry about so that. No, it's okay. My I have a three-year-old daughter, and she just brings everything home from nursery. Um, yeah. You know, it's a bowl every other week. All right. So uh, I guess I'll start with kind of the economic strains that are faced across the continent. Uh, obviously, not just in North Africa, but everywhere. And, and a lot of these are uh, not just limited to Africa uh, either. Uh, one common theme, of course, is imported inflation and stresses on debt burdens caused in part by the strengthening dollar and related Fed, uh, the Federal Reserve Bank uh, rate increases that uh, Nick was discussing. Uh, countries such as Ghana, Nigeria, Kenya, Angola, Zambia, Congo Brazzaville, among others, faced heavy debt burdens or debt servicing burdens, even if their actual debt to GDP ratio was not particularly high, like Nigeria. Um, these countries are not, are less able to adequately address the struggles of populations dealing with higher food and fuel costs uh, because they don't have the fiscal space to do it. Uh, and this illustrates a deeper and longer term problem, uh, which I think Ghana might represent an extreme example at the moment. It has the world's worst performing currency, has headline inflation of something around 40%, uh, major difficulties in increasing domestic revenue, and is facing a serious debt crisis and is currently in talks with the IMF, uh, which are meant to uh, resolve in December, but you know, who knows whether that's actually going to happen or not. Um, so this, this issue relates to countries, including most African countries, who are particularly vulnerable to crises in public finance and debt because of their dependence on commodity exports. Now, because of the Ukraine war and uh, the increase in global food prices, uh, some African countries have actually benefited from the current economic conjuncture. South Africa is an example. Uh, which has benefited from substantially uh, increased revenues because of uh, global commodity prices. But for the most part, country, most African countries are dependent on fuel imports and even fuel exporters like or oil exporters like Nigeria uh, don't refine their own oil. So they have to import gasoline or petrol, uh, which actually increases their cost and places pressure on their balance of payments and currency values. Um, another related issue is that uh, International financial institutions and multilateral creditors and bilateral creditors, commercial creditors, uh, none of the above have really developed appropriate frameworks to address these deeply embedded structural issues that actually go back decades. Um, things like the much hailed and relatively recent uh, G20 debt uh, uh, services suspension initiative, which dated back to the, kind of the, the COVID, the beginning of COVID, um, didn't really demonstrate a real effectiveness beyond kind of the margins. I mean, helped some countries kind of kick their debt problems down the road a bit, but didn't really address anything substantial. Um, a recent IMF agreement with Zambia, uh, for instance, has imposed severe conditions that are reminiscent of 1990s era structural adjustment policies, which uh, had relatively uneven, but often negative uh, impacts on state capacity across the continent. Even if they, even in one or two instances, you could argue they actually had relatively positive impacts on longer term economic growth, like in Uganda and potentially Ghana. Um, the main reasons for these vulnerabilities are structural and are not only linked to corrupt and venal politicians and profligate spending, which is often the case. We often say, okay, these governments are just 
spending too much money and they're being irresponsible for the finances. And that's certainly true in some cases and even a lot of cases. But even that issue is um, related to, uh, is a product of the material constraints that a lot of poor states face. Uh, these limited resources make control of government a much higher stakes issue for politicians and, and political parties uh, than it does for, for richer countries. And this delivers higher incentives for politicians and, and individual actors to intensify their efforts to hoard resources for personal and communal or political purposes. And that increases rates of corruption and therefore has a negative impact on things like economic growth, but also weighs on public finances uh, because of the way that spending is, is oftentimes jacked up to incredibly high levels when it probably shouldn't be, but also uh, increasing things like uh, the national debt burden. Um, the only longer term solution to this, which is often discussed, and you hear this in every kind of investment forum and every kind of uh, forum d dedicated to African economic issues, but not just limited to Africa, is economic diversification. But African countries tend to they face real structural obstacles to, to doing this in a substantive way. Um, and uh, this relates to their peripheral status in the global economy and related difficulties in raising sufficient capital to diversify their economies. For instance, if you want to build a big road system, uh, private investors generally don't want to get involved in that. But you need a big road system in order to uh, lower transaction costs and to develop your internal market. So you have to rely on raising finances from elsewhere, especially international financial institutions or the World Bank, to try to get these done, these things done. So a country like Ghana, for instance, which uh, is facing probably the most severe debt crisis of any African country at the moment, um, actually uh, is in a situation where it was kind of following all the prescriptions of the IMF and the World Bank for making for trying to diversify its economy in the past decade. They made uh, substantially, uh, well, they made very substantial efforts to increase electricity output, for instance. But that relies on cap private capital. They had, to they had to reform their banking system uh, to match international norms, but that was a very costly exercise. And these things together kind of are, are one of the major reasons why Ghana is facing a debt crisis today. Um, the because of this and because of, uh, of issues of raising private capital and the lack of um, resources that states have uh, to invest in diversification initiatives themselves, plus corruption, plus vested interest, makes economic diversification diversification difficult, if not impossible for, for most countries, uh, at least in the medium term. And it should also be noted that the countries that have really successfully diversified their economies are um, mostly in East Asia. And the reasons for this are, are related to kind of political and geopolitical and economic circumstances that don't necessarily apply in the African context. Um, and, you know, which I think uh, raises some questions about uh, the longer term ability of, of several African states, particularly Nigeria, which I'll get to in a second, to kind of emerge from their structural crisis that they're finding themselves in at the moment. So uh, now I'll, I'll talk about Africa's two largest economies, uh, South Africa and Nigeria. Um, now I'll first talk about South Africa, which is technically the second largest economy. It used to be the largest, um, but now it's the second largest. Now, recently, there's been some good news out of South Africa in the sense that they've managed a degree of budgetary consolidation uh, as a result of windfall tax revenues relating to global exports, uh, increases in exports because of the Ukraine war, but also longer term kind of inflationary trends uh, and probably longer term demand for things like copper, uh, which will only continue to grow because of their usefulness for uh, renewable energy and things like that. So these are potentially beneficial trends for South Africa. Um, but this uh, budgetary consolidation in South Africa potentially comes at the expense of, of longer term growth. And it's a lot of economists uh, believe at the moment that uh, the South African government's growth projections, which uh, range in the high one early low 2% categories for the next several years are actually optimistic and are too optimistic. So we're not going to see, so a lot of the kind of advances that South Africa has made in terms of revenue generation might not uh, be uh, sustainable in the longer term because of slow growth uh, or, or you know, very low growth. Um, the government's making some headway in corruption prosecutions, which is a really critical issue in terms of trying to get out of the legacies of the Jacob Zuma presidency, uh, the, uh, which lasted from 2009 to 2018, in which uh, much of the state was, uh, in South Africa, they use the term state capture. So much of the state was subverted by kind of private and corrupt interests, which had a, a massive 
possibly negative impact on state capacity. And the current president, Ciro Ramaphosa, has long promised to try to address these issues, but only recently in the past six months have you really seen an uptick in corruption prosecutions. And uh, it just so happens that next uh, in 2024, there'll be a, a new presidential election. Um, and the ruling ANC party is, is currently projected to, to, well, win the election, but uh, lose its majority, uh, potentially its parliamentary majority, uh, because of widespread resentment and discontent after uh, law, the rule of the country since 1994. Um, now, the, there are, just like many other African countries uh, and, and countries elsewhere, resource constraints might, may place material limits on how far reform efforts can go. Um, needed sectoral transformations in reform, particularly in energy and transport, are, are hindered by entrenched interest in corruption. Um, and we've seen uh, also the lasting legacies of aging infrastructure and the inabilities to reinvest uh, in upgrading that infrastructure in the past three or four years with uh, massive waves of power outages in South Africa, which have had a very negative impact on South African economic growth because industries require electricity to function. Uh, and unfortunately, ESCOM, the state-owned enterprise, which is which generates electricity, uh, is projecting that these power outages will last for several more years before enough generating capacity is built to, to address them. Um, another issue kind of hindering sectoral transformation are, are thorny labor disputes, which pit workers and uh, with often very legitimate grievances, it has to be said, um, often related to kind of under inflation level pay increases. Uh, and politically powerful unions, uh, it pits them against governments and state-owned enterprises which don't have the resources to necessarily re meet worker demands. And because of that, we've this year alone has seen several major strikes uh, in ESCOM, the power generating company, Transnet, which is in charge of uh, logistics and uh, port facilities, um, which have had uh, impacts on, on economic growth in the broader economy. Um, and these are not easily resolvable tensions. And as we go into 2023, there's a possibility of a major public sector uh, wage strike, uh, which again could have an impact on, on uh, economic growth, uh, as well as the political stability in the country. Um, so I'm going to move on to Nigeria. Uh, Nigeria similarly, uh, similarly suffers from serious structural difficulties, but at, at a much higher degree of magnitude, uh, order of magnitude, I should say. Uh, there are multiple security crises, which are increasingly making large parts of the countryside ungovernable. Uh, there's a, a partially transformed and expanding jihadist insurgency. Uh, there's widespread banditry, particularly in the northwestern part of Nigeria. Uh, and this encompasses ethnic and communal tensions over land and resources, as well as kind of criminal enterprises. There's also separatist violence, particularly in the southeast and a bit in the southwest. There are farmer herder conflicts, which uh, span the breadth of the country, uh, religious tensions, and as we approach the elections this coming year, uh, in, in early 2023, in February and March, uh, presidential and legislative and state level elections, uh, we're seeing increases in partisan political violence. And I'm happy to talk about the elections in, 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 the, um, in the questions if anybody has any questions about that. Um, this comes on top of a major currency crisis, uh, as the central bank is increasingly rationing dollars to maintain its reserves. Uh, and the country is facing high inflation, uh, headline inflation, the re most recent figures uh, are somewhere around 20%. Uh, serious reductions in foreign investment levels, uh, governments which, which has blown through its debt and deficit targets, and critically declines in oil output and revenues, which will be difficult to reverse. And there are a lot of reasons for that. Part of it relates to oil theft and insecurity, uh, vandalism, but also the declining sense among internet among oil majors that uh, Nigeria is a profitable place to invest. So, and also there's aging infrastructure. So, and related to this, there's a looming debt crisis, which is possible as well, uh, particularly related to the inability of the government to service, uh, to service its, its current, the debt that's due in the next two years. Um, although if you look at the headline numbers, the actual numbers don't look too bad. The actual debt to GDP ratio is, is not particularly high, but the debt servicing is, is through the roof at the moment. Um, so in other words, as insecurity is escalating, the next presidential administration, whoever gets elected, and I would say right now the favored candidate is probably Bola Tinubu, who's the candidate of the ruling uh, All People's Congress, the APC party. Uh, and they, uh, there's a number of reasons why I think he'll, he'll probably win, but 
that doesn't mean an upset is not possible. Uh, the uh, Abub, uh, Atiku Abubakar of the opposition PDP uh, may benefit from the fact that there's a lot of anger against the ruling party. And then there's a third party candidate, Peter Obi, who has actually topped several polls in September, but um, lacks campaign infrastructure and uh, may have difficulties actually mobilizing votes when, when voting day comes. So uh, we'll see what happens in, in February, but I think Bolotin is likely to be the next president of Nigeria. Unfortunately, what that means is the policies that the current Buhari administration have pursued will probably continue uh, without much change. Um, so just a quick note on uh, West Africa uh, and its broader security situation. Today, uh, France is announcing the formal end of Operation Barkhan, which was its main military intervention against jihadist groups in the Sahel. Um, this follows their exit from Mali earlier this year, following a, a dramatic breakdown in relations with Mali, uh, particularly over Mali's decision to bring in Russian mercenaries from the Wagner Group. So while French military operations will continue in the region, especially in Niger, this reflects a broader failure of international interveners to, ex to stem the expansion of jihadist groups and generalized insecurity. Um, there's been a regional wave of coups since 2020, uh, two in Mali, two in Burkina Faso. There's been one coup attempt in Niger, a uh, coup in Chad, and even the coup in Guinea uh, all reflect a broader crisis of government legitimacy, which is widespread throughout the region. Uh, and this is partly exacerbated by abuse of security forces and authoritarian government. Uh, economic strains uh, will only worsen these underlying trends, and they also might make it difficult for coastal West African states like Ghana and Bena uh, and Togo to effectively prevent the spread of jihadist insurgencies into their own territories. Uh, so on that cheery note, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nathaniel. Uh, and now I'd like to give the floor to Dr. Matt Ward for East Africa. Thanks, Nadine. And I realize time's a bit brief, so I'll, I'll, I'll try and keep it brief. Uh, the others have already kind of foregrounded my, my headline item, which is to say that the global economic downturn and the ripple effects from the Ukraine conflict have had a really significant impact on, on, on East and Central Africa. Around about this time last year, we were talking about a modest post-pandemic recovery across most of the regional economies that could be built on going into 2022. Now we're talking about growth slowing in almost every country across the region. And for most, this trend is likely to continue into 2023. We've already talked a bit about debt sustainability, which was already a problem before the pandemic, but we're much more concerned now. Although there's nowhere where we really anticipate a sovereign debt default, the fiscal costs of indebtedness have increased markedly. Rising interest rates are increasing borrowing costs and a strong US dollar and weakening regional currencies are increasing debt service costs. And this, of course, means that there's very little excess room to, to, to spend on, on the many pressing priorities that the region faces. Inflation's a, a, another big issue. Although East, East Africa is, is not so exposed as, as some other MENA economies to supply chain interruptions from Russia and Ukraine specifically, it is extremely vulnerable to volatility in food and energy prices because it is highly dependent upon imports of both food and fuels. And what's perhaps more important is these basic necessities account for almost 50% of household spending across the region. So what price pressures can have huge social and economic implications. Meanwhile, the timing perhaps couldn't be worse. Not only is everybody struggling to recover from the pandemic, but the region has been hit by a series of climate-related related disasters. Somalia, Ethiopia and Kenya have suffered an unprecedented four consecutive seasons of drought. A fifth is forecast and is indeed now getting underway. Sudan and South Sudan have suffered multi-year floods that are among the worst in living memory. The combination of climate shocks, food price inflation, and, and, and also political unrest has, has produced the world's most acute hunger crisis with some 50 million people uh, in East Africa facing crisis conditions and another 27 million in the DRC. Famine is almost certain to hit parts of Somalia before the end of the year. South Sudan is also at high risk. It's abundantly clear that this is related to climate change and there is good reason to fear that similar problems could recur again. And all of this is happening in a, in a period of particular political turbulence. East and Central Africa tend to have a reputation for political turbulence, but of late this has been more pronounced than usual. 
And what's more, the biggest political crises are affecting the biggest regional states, which obviously have ripple effects on neighboring countries. In the Democratic Republic of the Congo, where I should mention the economy at least is doing better than usual on the back of strong commodity prices, elections are due in a year. Nobody is quite sure whether elections will be held on time, and there are strong indications that they will not be, but whether they're on time or, or not, we're, we're likely to see a period of considerable political volatility in the run up to elections as old alliances break up and new ones form. Already this is starting to happen. In the notoriously unstable East, insecurity is worse than it has been in years. All eyes are on the M23 rebellion, but elsewhere levels of violence have also risen. Attention is rightly on the M23 crisis though, as it has significant capacity to destabilize the wider region. Notably, Congo accuses Rwanda of supporting the M23, while Rwanda accuses Congo of arming Rwandan rebels and former genocide theirs, and both allegations are highly credible. Other regional countries are sending troops to join a regional intervention force, but in the case of Burundi and Uganda, at least these are aimed largely at containing their own armed opposition groups active in Eastern DRC and of asserting their cross-border spheres of influence. Relations between Rwanda, Uganda, and Burundi have historically been fraught. So far, they have held up under this pressure, but it can't be excluded that they could break down again. In Sudan, more than a year after a coup, there is still no political settlement. A draft constitutional document produced by the Sudan Bar Association has received widespread popular support, and there are closed door discussions between the military and mainstream opposition factions around a settlement nominally on the basis of this document. But it's quite clear that for the negotiations to have any kind of success, they're going to have to dilute that document's aspirations, particularly around the role of the military in politics. And this risks any agreement being rejected by the population. Meanwhile, continued splits and infighting within the opposition weakens their negotiating position and their credibility. To end on a slightly more positive note, in Somalia, a protracted electoral crisis has ended in a peaceful transition of power. The optimism this has generated, frankly, rests upon more upon relief of uh, former President Farmajo's departure than enthusiasm for incoming President Hassan Sheikh Mohammed, but there is more optimism there now than there was a year ago. The early months of Hassan Sheikh's term have been dominated by the fight against jihadist group Al-Shabaab, and despite some suffering some very serious terrorist attacks, the government has made some notable battlefield gains, which are the first in, in, in many years. However, the real question will be whether the government can sustain these gains and translate this into long-term stability. And on this front, there's less optimism. And finally, in Ethiopia, and what is arguably in the most serious crisis affecting the region, perhaps even the deadliest conflict in the world, with the UN estimating over half a million people have been killed in just two years of war, and this may well be a low estimate, there is now a peace deal. It's an extremely uneven peace deal. It comes very close to complete capitulation on the part of Tigrayan forces, but it is a peace deal. Unsurprisingly, there will be those who criticize the deal and some who may act as spoilers. Implementation is likely to be complicated. It will be fraught with risk and it will be littered with delays, but there is some reason to think that both sides now believe this deal is the best they can hope for, and therefore they may seek to honor it. Even if the deal does hold and Ethiopia faces enormous challenges, the economy has been stretched to breaking point, as has national cohesion. There are multiple other active conflicts across the country, nothing even approaching a national consensus on the country's future, and an extreme lack of trust among political actors at all levels. This is going to be extremely difficult to overcome, but one thing that perhaps almost all Ethiopians can agree on is that an end to the war in Tigray is a necessary first step. And I'll leave it there. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Matt, for your presentation. Um, I would like to go through some of our questions. They're quite interesting, so we'll take the we'll take one. It's for, uh, from Reda El Ahmadi. So her question is uh, for Dr. Warwick. Lebanese citizens are hopeless about the performance of their politicians. What advice can you give us on how to cope with the economic crisis for the next 24 months, Dr. Warwick? Uh, a nice challenging question to start with. Um, I, I would point out we're not really in the advice game uh, as, as Oxford Analytica. Um, but if you did transport me to Lebanon to, to advise the, the Lebanese on this, um, 
I'm not really sure uh, how we could go about this. Uh, until the politicians get their act together in, in Lebanon, start considering the population rather than their own narrow uh, factional, sectional uh, interests, it's going to be very difficult to address that problem. Um, if I was a Lebanese person, it would, and I, I really love the country, having travelled round there a few times. <laughs> Their best, the, the the best way that they can um, address the problems at the moment is to access foreign currency. Those Lebanese with access to foreign currency through uh, remittances, for example, are able, far more able, to mitigate the problems of the economic crisis. Uh, and this is why you're seeing, as well, Lebanese trying to migrate to, to Europe. Um, th this is the only way that they can see out. But for me, it's a hopeless situation until the politicians get their act together. Yeah, um, thank you, Dr. Warwick. We have another point from Len Graham um, for Katerina. You mentioned how in Tunisia and other countries, the incoming government is in a lack of a better word inheriting the problems of the previous government. How could this cycle be changed, especially when solutions often involve reliance on other countries for aid or financial support? The way I see it, national debt that is uncervicable is inevitable, especially for the poorer countries. As mentioned by Dr. Powell, the private institutions are often unwilling to invest in local infrastructure such as roads. So how could it be that less loans should be given to poorer countries, which would have major issues for those countries that rely on those loans? I guess this is like a multiple question sort of question. So, uh, Katharina? Well, I'll, I'll just tackle the Tunisian aspect of it. Where, yeah, you, you're right in that there's like a chicken and egg situation going on, um, I suppose. I mean, in, in, the, in Tunisia specifically, uh, so the major, major issue is that there's an, a massively bloated state sector, right? So they have a lot of civil servants, um, I think Tunisia was at the top in terms of civil servant um, ratio, and they can't pay everybody properly. So one of the things that needs to get done is how reduce that um, those payments, right? Reduce the civil service. Um, the problem with that is that the civil service. Uh, has a very large membership in the major labor union, the UGTT, and they tend to obstruct any effort at either decreasing salaries or um, decreasing the sector in general. So, over the past, since 2011, since the, the uprising, um, Governments have tried to do that, and they have been unable to, to. I mean, I don't even know actually how much, how hard they have tried because the, the resistance from the UGTT has been great. So this is what foreign investors see, and they don't like. They don't like the chances of how of how the 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 Tunisian government can manage the economy, right? And that makes it less able to get loans. So yeah, then you have the Gulfies who come in as a sort of saviors and they're like, well, yes, we will give you money, but you have to give us stakes in your profitable companies because they don't trust the government to give them money back. So it, it's a massive problem. How do you solve it? I don't know. <laughs> I guess there's um, other multilateral institutions and, and negotiations that are happening at the moment that's, you know, are trying to get problems like that more on um, 
to get resolved, but uh, there are massive issues, especially for like other countries as well, not just in Asia, that have governance problems, right? So if you don't trust the government, if the investors don't trust the government, and we saw that in the UK recently as well, right? When, in the, when the investors don't trust the government, it's very difficult to do anything on debt and the economy more generally. And uh, Ellen, uh, I don't know if anyone else <laughs> wants to jump in on that. Thank you, thank you, Katharina. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, I think it's quite a complicated one. But um, yeah, um, another question from Abdullah Telmi. Can democracy solve all economic growth problems? Not sure who can take this question. I can I can well, briefly I then talk about this again because of the Tunisia ex experiments, right? Because Tunisia became a, 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 a democracy, a problematic democracy, um, but it, but it was a democracy for a long time, well, for a long, for the, the best part of the of the of the last ten years, and partly because it was so problematic, it was unable to to focus on the economic problems that the country was facing. The political class could not agree. There was no effective opposition that could provide an alternative to what was going on. Most of the political class was trying to just um, find an arrangement that would allow them to stay in power. And people really reacted to that. Part of the reason that Kai Sayed is in power now, with a large majority of support from the public, is that uh, Tunisians got really disenchanted with democracy and the democracy that they were seeing. But the primary issue there then goes back goes to the quality of the democracy you're getting and whether institutions are functioning independently. Tunisia never got a, 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 a high court, so it never got a court that would function as a, as a balance between the president and the parliament. And so when there was a disagreement between the president and the parliament, there was no one to adjudicate. Um, so, I think, uh, uh, you know, how the state functions, how governance, how effective governance is, plays a massive role on where the economic problems can be resolved, and that's not necessarily tied to democracy. I mean, you could have, I suppose, a dictatorship that's quite effective, um, but it might not be particularly good for people's human rights. I'll stop that. I might just jump in there and say that um, oftentimes, I mean, to kind of reiterate the issue about governance quality, but also because of the kind of deep structural constraints that a lot of countries are under in terms of boosting economic growth that are often independent of policies of individual governments, at least partially independent, um, makes it hard to say what governance type is better, except, you know, on indices that you can actually measure more specifically like human rights or you know uh, delivering services and that sort of thing the problem in africa uh is historically authoritarian regimes uh have oftentimes in the short term performed better than democracies but in the longer term they prefer they, they uh in, in terms of economic growth but in the longer term they perform worse than democracies in terms of economic growth so if you want to look at it in that sense uh, and if there is a correlation, there's just there a correlation between longer term political structures and longer term economic uh, performance, then uh, there's a clear bias in terms of democracy there as, as, a, as a better performer than authoritarian uh, governance. And the reason for that is that authoritarian governance uh, is much, particularly military governance, but authority governments of all time, of all kinds, is much more prone to corruption. Of course, democratic governance is also corrupt. Uh, can also be very corrupt uh, and not just in Africa but there are mechanisms there to at least expose that corruption that aren't there in authoritarian systems um, and that transparency has a role to play in terms of uh, providing information that uh, investors or local economic actors can more easily and effectively base their economic decision making on whereas an authoritarian context is a lot more difficult um, or often a lot more difficult at least in the longer term um, again, shorter term is is very different, though. Yeah. Um, thank you. 
we have a question from Kenya, uh, from Rogers Musamali, saying fantastic presentation by Matt Wirt uh, on East Africa. So he's from Kenya and he's, um, he's asking, you'd love to hear Matt's views on the shrinking uh, fiscal space in light of a new administration that has made lots of promises that been pushing the limits in terms of borrowing. Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, yeah, President William Ruto has, has, has come into the job in Kenya facing an extraordinarily difficult position. There is absolutely no fiscal headroom. Um, and yet he has made a lot of very big promises both to the population as well as to political leaders in order to secure his election. And fundamentally, he's not going to be able to meet any of them. Uh, well, that's not true. He's fundamentally not going to be able to meet all of them. Um, he has tried to, to keep to some of the prop, some of the promises. For example, within a week of uh, being uh, elected, he rolled back subsidies on fuel. Um, he returned customs clearance operations to Mombasa port. But none of these have, have these short-term uh, economic problems. He doesn't have much scope for borrowing new money. The, the, the debt overhang is simply too high. The biggest thing Kenya could do to, to kind of change its, its budgetary outlook is to, is to reduce uh, expenditures, recurrent expenditures. I don't have to figure now, but it, it's almost two thirds of, of the budget is recurrent spent expenditures. And, and a lot of this is on public service salaries. Uh, Kenyan politicians are not only amongst the highest paid in Africa, but they're amongst the highest paid in the world. Um, and a great deal of this is, you know, sort of benefits and stipends for, for simply attending sessions, you know, fuel allowances, home allowances, so on and so forth. You know, it's it would be the clearest, easiest thing for him to do to, to, to change the economy would be to address this. But the big problem he faces is that it's parliament that votes on these things. And it's a parliament where he's not fully in control. After the elections, it looked like he was going to be a narrow minority government. He's managed to sway some people over to his side, and he's now got a narrow majority in parliament, but it's still a very, very narrow one. And frankly, these are all people who benefit from the current system, and even his allies feel like this is our turn at the trough. So I think I think Ruto is going to have a very, very difficult uh a difficult time turning Kenya's economy around. And I think, you know, he, he realizes that. He, he talked about making changes within 100 days. He's now talking about making changes within a year. I think in three months time, he's going to be talking about making changes by the end of his term. Um, but yeah, I'll leave it there. Thank you, Dr. Ma. Um, I actually have a question, and uh, I wanted to ask this for all of our analysts, but I think for the sake of time, maybe Nicholas can take this question. And how is it how analysts draw their analysis or to, to write expert briefings? So if, if you can share with us the resources that you rely on, how you build your analysis, because it's um, the key um, feature of these analysis that they are unbiased. So can be challenging thank you a really good question so uh how analysts do their daily job um they work as often as possible with uh, a range of information sources they're very uh, aware of bias they use local languages wherever they can original sources wherever they can uh, so a big part of that is is simply trying to uh, ensure that you have the best grip on the information in terms of producing the expert briefings, each briefing is somewhat of a collaboration between members of our expert network and the analysts uh, which you see on this call. So uh, if we're writing on uh, conflict in Tigray, for instance, we would have uh, somebody in, in Ethiopia that uh, is drafting that and is working with Matt uh, through probably several rounds of conversation in order to get the brief into the shape that we want it to be. It's also the case that uh, there's a certain amount of internal review that goes on. So what you're seeing is a consensus Oxford view, one that is uh, doesn't contradict internally um, across the various regions. So there are many stages to this. Um, uh, if you look at our website, you can see a bit more uh, detail on that, on the methodology, the processes in particular that we adopt 
in order to do so. And just to finish on the point that Warwick alluded to at the start, um, when we get questions, what government, what should the government do? They're ones that uh, are somewhat uncomfortable for us. You know, we're not a think tank. We don't advocate. Our job is simply to understand the world as it is, to identify the drivers, because that's good analysis, and then to draw, to plot a trajectory so we have a sense of where things might be going next. So we don't try to fix the world, we just try to understand the world. And uh, that has a big bearing on our, our mission, but that is our mission, crucially. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nicholas. Uh, I think the, the 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 end of your talk, the we're not trying to fix the world, we're trying to understand it. I think this is one of the summaries of um, your role and your mission. This is correct. Um, and I think for the time, we will not be able to have uh, any more questions. We did, however, uh, prepare a few polls. If we would like, if um, our attendees would like to participate in the poll. I'm going to now uh, launch it. So you will see questions popping in when you can answer yes or no. Okay. That was the end of our poll. And for the last questions, I can tell that we actually received one of the suggestions to have um, the the same concept of the, the webinar, but not just for the Middle East, but for um, the, the, for the globe, for the world. So we might actually have a sequel uh, of this webinar, if possible, for the Oxford and Attica again. Um, as mentioned, uh, the, the, the webinar and the session is recorded. You will receive a copy for, for the recording in 24 hours after the webinar, along with a certificate of attendance. So I would like to thank our Oxford Analytica partners, uh, our analysts, um, our, the analyst director, Dr. Nicholas. I'd like to thank everyone, Dr. Warwick, Dr. Matt, Dr. Nathaniel, Tarina, and Gabby Hart, our product manager for cases. And I'd like to thank all of our attendees uh, today. Thank you so much. And we'll, um, we'll, we'll see if, if there will be a sequel for the webinar. Thanks much for attending. Have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.